it's not last week in my head it's last week last meeting we talked about wanting to focus in on kind of some form of co-created questionnaire where we find out a bit about the person and about who they are and their background we wanted to know a bit about their knowledge of dementia and we wanted to know some of the things that might help or hinder them getting involved in research or co-production. Um, some of these things have had certain amounts of research done. Um, some haven't. Some have had research done, but in a different way, like an interview. So by pulling this together, we're doing something a bit new and a bit different. But also it's remembering that part of the reason we're doing this and I say this to you as much as to myself, is it's also to kind of practice an example of taking a piece of research from this idea of us talking about it and thinking this could work right through to the end so that you get to be part of a full research process. And I think in doing that, um, what we hope is that it will also make it easier or help you feel more confident when inputting on other people's research ideas and other people's research design, because you'll have been through that full process from start to finish. And hopefully that will be a useful thing and an enjoyable thing. We want it to be enjoyable. Um, so that's kind of how we've got to where we are today. Today's meeting, my plan, and feel free to overturn it. Um, but for once, I'm, I'm getting better at these plans, David. I hope you've noticed. I've been trying really hard. Um, <laughs> uh, the plan is to go through some of the kind of things to think about in terms of where we're at. And then, so it'll be a bit of bit of hearing my voice for a bit, and then to have a discussion about some of the examples that um, I think you'll have just received uh, in by email, and some of you might have had them in the post potentially um, of some questionnaires that we can have a look at, and we can go through things we like, things we don't like, things we'd do differently, and why, um, and start to play around with what we would want to see. Um, does that all sound like a plan? So start with the, here's some food for thought from me, and then we'll have a discussion about what we would like from what we want to do. Okay, fab. Right, so I've even prepared, I'm shocking myself this morning, I have prepared a PowerPoint. Um, I'm very proud of myself, as you can tell. It's a, when I'm this organised, I like to really, really make sure you all know that I'm proud of it. Um, so let's get this working. Um, okay, right. So I'm going to share. Do, do, do. Okay, right now I can't see you. So that's, let me make you all bigger. So can you now see a front page that says co-research dementia group? Is that what you can all see? Lovely. That's what we like to see. OK, so. This works. We're really pleased. So going over basically what I've just said, um, we talked about what what we wanted to do and why. Um, so looking at why people may or may not get involved in research or PPI. And one of the reasons we chose this is because obviously you will have first hand experience of, of choosing to get involved. And we've been working over the last last couple of years, really, on looking at what might help people get involved. We've done things like familiar faces we've started. So there's we know that there are things to think about there. But last meeting, one of the things that came up quite strongly was that we would need to get a sense of what people's knowledge of dementia was. So it wasn't just about whether they might like to get involved in dementia related activities, but actually what they even understood of dementia first, um, as we thought that would be particularly um, important in their kind of reasoning behind then getting involved in the next bit. Um, does that all sound nice and familiar and everyone happy with that? Cool. OK, so. Then it's about thinking about some practicalities around if we are to create a survey. So one of the benefits of designing a survey, and I have realised I've switched between the term questionnaire and survey regularly. There's not a right or wrong. It's whichever you prefer. They're the same thing. 
that they're not it's not trying to trick you um i think one's probably a more americanized and one's probably more uk english i'm not sure um but as far as i know no real difference between the two um but essentially we need to think about a few different um questions and i i say think about because these are the sorts of questions that if we were to present the survey to say um, another research group, things that they would want to know from us about it, to know whether it, it, it did its job kind of thing and, and kind of critique it, I suppose, to check that it's, it's doing what we think. So some things we need to think about are obviously who our target audience is. Um, and I suppose we've got two different target audiences if we're, if we're looking at knowledge as well, in that we've got the kind of general public um target audience i think we then said we'd have the healthcare professional kind of target audience and then we'd have the audience of people with lived experience of dementia who may or may not be involved in um patient public involvement already so i think we'd kind of said that there were kind of three groups that we wanted to look at but using the same set of questions so that we could kind of compare knowledge compare understanding and compare kind of uh, what they thought motivations and things might be because we think they might be different. Um, again, that can change depending on what, you, what you'd like to do. But certainly from my notes from the last meeting, that's kind of where we got to is that we wanted to do the same questions across a few different target audiences, which is absolutely fine. In terms of what we want to learn from the survey, there's a few different things. There's primarily we said we wanted to look at people's motivations and the kind of barriers and facilitators to doing the type of work that you were all doing. But we also wanted to learn whether individual factors is what we'd call them, whether things about that person might shape the answers that they give. Um, and those factors might be, um, we could argue it could be things to do with age, gender, past experience of dementia, knowledge of dementia. You know, there's there's lots of different factors we could choose to focus in on um, and we think of those because we look at them whether they essentially correlate with with what we found so if we find that lots of people are saying that they know loads about dementia and they feel really confident um, but it turns out they've never met someone to met with dementia we can go well that might be slightly um, misguided confidence is what we could call that well, but it could be, could be wrong they could be excellent the other thing to think about and what we're going to have some fun with um, once I've gone through these bits is the type of questions we want to ask. So there are pre-existing surveys and there are um, make it from scratch DIY surveys. And I've got some examples of those um, and we can go through those um, shortly, which should be good. Um, we've also got the how will they complete it? Do we want it to be an online survey? Do we want it to be a postal survey do we want it to be both do we want it to be um my brain's now not able to think of any other mid drops what we've done previously in some places is we've done a pop-up survey where you kind of pop up in a town center and you ask people as they're passing to fill it in um we've done that before you know there are different ways that you can um capture people and sometimes get get those different audiences i suppose um, I must admit, I wasn't the one standing in the cold in the in the centre of Exeter. That was a student's job, but they did it and that was fabulous. Um, <laughs> but that is an option. Um, and then we have to think about the types of responses. And again, I'll go through that in a bit more detail. But what we mean there is in terms of whether people are going to write kind of long answers, whether they're going to write kind of full sentences, whether it's a single word answer, whether it's a numerical answer or something that we could turn into a number. So, um, oh, what needs to disappear? I'm sure she'll come back to us. Um, if not, could you keep an eye on um, the email, Helen, for me? Thank you. Um, so if, say, the answer options are yes and no, that could be converted to a one and two if we were trying to look at it from a patterns and numbers um, perspective. Um, and then it's always important to think about what we'll do with the responses, both in terms of how we would analyse them but also what we're going to do with if we, you know, conduct the survey, fill it in, lovely. We've got all of this information. Um, this is the problem when Winnie's under the sea, look. It, sometimes you lose your signal, Winnie. It's, uh, yeah. You're yeah. back with us. <laughs> yeah. That's, you okay that's there? Good. Yep, still working okay? Yeah. 
not ready. It just it just lost it completely. Oh. I'm not sure whether there's a button on her headphones that is pressing leave without her realizing. Um, but maybe worth suggesting we just don't know what happens. Um, but I'll move I'll move on to the next bit and uh, we'll see what we get to. Um, so survey types. Um, in terms of you, you probably already know a lot of this, and that's absolutely fine. Um, we are recording it, so there might be some people that maybe are less familiar with it, and it's also okay if you are less familiar with it. Um, but in terms of survey types, um. One of the things is obviously thinking about any that you've completed in the past and what you thought was maybe good or bad about them. If there were any that, you know, you completed that really irritated you and you think, why did that irritate me? That's good. Good for us to know. Um, can you hear us all right, Winnie? Lovely. Um, so when we or when you hear the word standardised questionnaire, it just means that the same exact same questionnaire has been used across uh, multiple settings. And it has to be asked the same way. The questions are the same each time. Um, there's no no room for variability in terms of how the questionnaire is done. The reason for that is that it's been um, tested to check that the questions ask what they think and that they it does the right things. It's had all these kind of background uh, checks to make sure it does what it says on the tin. Um, so. That is an option and some of the things that you've been sent or that are in your email will be examples of standardised questionnaires generally. So questionnaires that have been used by multiple researchers across multiple studies. Um, and the benefit of these questionnaires is that it's much easier to compare your findings to other studies that have used that questionnaire. You can make much clearer um, comparisons because you can say, well, they asked these questions, so we're going to ask those same questions. They found this. We found a completely different answer. I wonder why that is. Whereas if you've made, if you're using your own questionnaire, it's not necessarily as easy to make that direct comparison. So there are there are absolutely good good things to take from standardised questionnaires. One of the challenges can be that you might not like the way it's worded or you actually you might not think it gets at what you'd like it to get at. And actually you might go, we don't want to answer a question like that. That doesn't that doesn't speak to us. And one of the things that is really argued in the kind of co-production PPI literature is about how some of these things just when people with lived experience are included in the process you get a very different answer around does it answer what we think it answers you know is this is this good enough do we need to change it and that's why more people are getting kind of lived experience involved because actually you might go that's a ridiculous question that i wouldn't answer that or that makes no sense um so then you have the option of ba -ba -ba, um no, still going with that one. Don't worry. I'm not even at the back of the bar. That's the next bit. Um, so things about ones that you've done before. I will come back to this with our examples. What we like about them, how they're answered, whether you like one more than another and why that might be. How many questions is too many? How many would put you off and make you go, I'm never answering that? How many is enough to get the information that we want to get to? And that's you might all have a slightly different answer to that, and that's okay. We will absolutely um, reach common ground. Um, I do realise I'm blitzing through this a little bit, but more so we have time to do the discussion bit. Not if there's anything you want me to go back over, please do shout. Um, but it's it's quite dry as it is. I'm aware of that, so we'll get to the fun bit. Um, you can also create your own. An example of this um, is one that was done by the Sunshiners group, which was the Dementia Inquiries group um, based in Kent. And they asked these four questions um, on the right, uh, which hopefully you can all see, but if you want me to read them out, I can. Um, so their survey asked, wanted to find out whether uh, they thought the visibility or invisibility of dementia was a good thing. And they asked people these four questions um, with just a yes or no answer. And then they co-analyze the results. What was excellent about this survey and was potentially because of the fact it was created by people with dementia as opposed to by researchers is they got 
loads of responses. Lots of people felt they could fill it in. So they had over 300 people respond. Um, and that potentially is a, a sign that people went, I can answer those few questions. Yep, lovely, done. Um, one of the challenges, though, from a research point of view is that I would potentially argue we might we might word the question slightly differently or actually like are we getting it what we think we're getting at and actually what we did find for a lot of people is when they expanded on the answer the answer was kind of I've said yes but actually it's a maybe um so sometimes just having yes or no can be problematic but it's it's very doable and can absolutely produce some really useful um results and can be analysed by people with lived experience, which is what we want to see. So, talked about the fact that we could analyse the data together. That will depend on the type of answers we collect, whether we collect word-based answers, number-based answers, a mix of the two. Um, we will also, I know we talked about the potential to do the questionnaire, but then maybe say, actually we really want to focus in on people who answered this and interview them and that might be that might be how we expand on certain things so it doesn't necessarily have to all be answered in that moment um but whenever we're creating a questionnaire we do want to think about what the the answers of that look like um and how they'll be analyzed and none of this will be alone this will be in collaboration with with myself and with other researchers if, that you would like involved um so at no point am i just going to send you a file of numbers and say look at this what do you think that that would be that would be very unfair um unless you really like numbers but um still context context is important here so things we need to think about what makes our work different um, part of that is that we are bringing kind of these different topics together that we think might um, might shape each other. So this kind of stuff around knowledge of dementia and research participation and involvement. We, we, we think there's probably a lot of overlap there. So we're going to look at it in the same space across the different um, target audiences. We need to think about whether we'd like to start from scratch, whether we'd like to create our own or whether we'd like to do a bit of both depending on the sections. With that, we want to think about the type of responses that we're collecting um, and how we'd analyse them. And importantly, very importantly, um, with this being kind of your survey and your research, it's what success in this piece of work would look like for you. What would you feel would make this this piece of work feel like that that was successful and glad we did that, that, that led to X, Y, and Z, and I'm happy about that. Um, and it's always important to kind of keep that at the back of your mind because obviously what we want to make sure is that we achieve achieve that as much as possible. And finally, just to go back over the facts of the process, we've where we've got to and where we're going. We've looked at some examples of current questionnaires. You have some of those available in front of you, and we'll go through those for the rest of the meeting if you're happy to. Um, we can talk about some of the strengths and the weaknesses of what's available, um, what's missing or what we didn't like. We then need to make a decision um, about which way we want to go with what ours looks like. And then what we can do is pilot it with any partners in research who maybe don't come to this group but are part of partners in research. Because, because they're part of the partners in research group, um, we wouldn't need ethics for that initial piloting because it would be a patient public involvement activity, a bit like the um, people at input request meetings we have. So we could say we're looking for people to look over our questionnaire and see whether it makes sense, see whether you're happy with it, see to so get that additional feedback um, from people that maybe haven't been part of creating it. Um, and then what we would do is we would apply to ethics so that we could share it with others and I have not included that process on this PowerPoint because that is going to be a whole session all by itself and you're going to love it. Um, but that's where we are just now. So let's check that if I stop sharing, it all takes us back to normal. It does. OK. How does that sound? Do you have any questions about any of the huge amount of information i've just chucked at you for david yeah i just wanted to be first again 
<laughs> do, you, do you not have a question? You just wanted to put your hand yeah, up first. Yeah, <laughs> Actually, I think that the, all the questionnaires that you sent us have made things more difficult for me on a personal basis because they're so varied. And I particularly liked the one for GPs, um, which I doubt they would answer. But anyway, um, <laughs> but what, I, yeah. what I, I did um, sort of learn from reading through all these um, questionnaires a couple of days ago was that it appears to me that we might need to have um, more than one type of questionnaire because I looked at some of the questions and, and I based on my own experience and the progress of what I, I was watching in dementia, um, I would answer things differently depending where I was in that stage. Mm -hmm. um, as a carer, um, if in the early stages, I would definitely answer some of the questions differently in the, in the latter stages. Yeah. Um, and also I thought some questions were irrelevant. Um, but it looks to me as though you, you might need to have more a questionnaire for, say, someone who is who does have dementia and is capable of answering questions uh, and a different one for carers. And then again, um, people who have no experience of dementia um, would answer things differently again. So I'm, I'm confused as to yeah. what we should be doing. Yeah, that makes sense because it is confusing. There's There's a lot of options. And I think this is where it's important to go back to the what are we trying to answer and why. Um, there is a certain amount of kind of filtering that can be done in terms of, you know, you can say to someone, um, for example, uh, are you a carer or someone living with dementia? You can ask whether they, how long they've been living with the diagnosis or supporting someone with the diagnosis. You can ask the type of dementia. You can, you can do you can get some of that knowledge so that you can explain some of that variation. Um, because, of course, you would, as you say, you would absolutely expect different answers. And the benefit of getting people to answer similar questions is you can then compare those answers. Whereas the trouble with when you have, say, uh, this is a questionnaire that's completely different for people with dementia, we've done a whole different one for carers, a whole different one for healthcare professionals, is, again, it gets harder to then compare what they're saying. Now, that might not be a problem if you're not trying to compare, if you're just trying to say, here is what it is for those different groups. But I think if we bring it back to what we're trying to ultimately explore is what the barriers and facilitators are to getting involved in um, co-research and patient and public involvement for people, we can then look at those factors, such as, you know, how long have you been supporting someone or you know, uh, what diagnosis have you had? Do you do you access any support services, anything like that? And we could start saying, well, actually, it looks like these factors are what are making a difference to these answers. Um, and that's where we that's what the analysis part of the survey is. It's kind of saying, do these things impact the things that are below? Um, but sometimes when you see these all these different things you could look at, because there's quite a lot that I didn't include where there's a lot where they go into kind of um, you've got things around awareness of dementia, you've got things around knowledge of dementia, you've got things around difference between knowledge of symptoms, knowledge of um, risk factors, knowledge of treatments, all, all of these different arms, legs, the lot. Um, and well, that's, I think, why, that's why I'm confused, Rosie, because if you, if you put it into one survey uh, and you ask sort of multiple choice questions and people go down a certain route, if they answer what, a question a certain way, then that adds to the length of the the questionnaire. You could have a really lengthy questionnaire mm -hmm. if you do it that way. So I, that's why I'm confused. So you could, yes, so you could filter it and you could it could make it lengthier. Or you could say, we think these are the most likely factors. And if then you find that actually none of those seem to be important you say well something's missing here or so there basically we could do it lots of different ways we could have a longer questionnaire we could collectively decide actually here are the things that we think are most important to focus on um we could decide that actually there's a risk of not getting enough information about one topic so maybe not covering it or doing it separately that there's not a right answer at the moment it's more kind of going what do we think would work but with that remembering as much as possible that what we would like to know is 
what the barriers and facilitators are to co-production and PPI. Um, so it might almost be worth us thinking about starting backwards and actually starting with what those questions would be and then kind of going what factors do we want to know about a person or about their knowledge of dementia that we think might shape how they answer these questions about co-production co and PPI um, because that might help kind of get through the kind of wood through the trees um, because at the moment there isn't really any questionnaires that look at specifically look at those barriers and facilitators to co-production or to PPI in dementia um, research. Um, again, when I did look to see if there were any, um, and Rosa's looked too, there's interviews that look at certain factors. So we might be able to, we could use the answers to those interviews to create a bit of multiple choice there, or we could keep it as an open question. There's There's ways we can integrate that, but that explicitly has not been asked before. So maybe to help with it, we start, we kind of do the questionnaire backwards. So instead of starting with the who you are and what your knowledge of dementia is, we go, what questions do we want to ask about involvement in um, co-research or PPI? And do we say co-research or actually do we just say PPI? Or, do we, you know, where do, where do we want to narrow it down? All, is all, all of these kind of things. Um, do you think that would be, would that make it easier to start that way around? Yeah, possibly, yeah. 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 That seemed logical to people. Okay. So before we look at those questionnaire examples then, let's start with that. You have all had involvement by being in this very meeting. You are all currently involved in patient and public involvement work. If we were to ask you about what has helped you get involved or what what's made made it harder to get involved is there a particular question you think we should be asking um that you would find uh useful to answer or that you feel you could answer and that would tell us something about why you got involved well i think i must go back to my own experience rosie um i got involved because i couldn't get answers to my questions basically Mm -hmm. Okay. Answers so, that satisfied me because just for someone to say to me that um, everyone's different doesn't tell me anything. Yeah. Okay. So I suppose that one of the questions that we will need to have on this questionnaire is Have you been involved or previously or currently um, in any form of patient public involvement for dementia? That's going to have to be a, a yes, no, isn't it? Um, yeah. and maybe some examples of that involvement. Winnie, on you go. I get involved because I wanted to make a difference and because I wanted to have a voice. Um, I'm glad this has been recorded because I'm going to use the transcript for some of this. Um, OK, so what we could do for that question is we could have a question that says, um, are you or have you been involved in patient and public involvement um, in dementia? And we could include a, a description of what patient and public involvement is um, at the start of the questionnaire. Um, and then we could say what reasons um, or what factors would make you get, what, what would help you get involved or what would make you get involved? Why would you get involved in that type of work, for example? Um, Again, as I say, we could work on how we word the question because that's not necessarily the right wording. But then what we could do is you could leave it completely open for people to answer it just, just how you two just have. Or what you could do is have the answers you've just given as examples that people could select. So you could have it that people could choose to pick for answers or to help people or to and select multiple of those as well as giving any additional reasons they might get involved um so you could that would be about changing how you answer the question do we use your experience of why you got involved as possible answers or do we leave it completely open for people to just put in their own experience and there again there's with everything you're going to find there's a there's pros and cons for both sides um fiona 
yeah, I would have probably a, a multiple choice of of, of possible answers because then you can also maybe look at filtering a bit more about thinking through the barriers as well, if you have the same for the barriers. So you've got a yes, no. Um, this is why I've got involved. This is why I haven't got involved. But then you can pinpoint a bit more um, how to encourage others, mm -hmm. you know, when you, you're coming out at the end. But also have a... A, an open button that they can put in the other if there's other reasons that we've not thought of yeah so we could have for this section of the questionnaire we could essentially have three three questions a why would you why might you get involved in patient public involvement work in dementia and we could include answers that you will um give for why you might get involved and then include an other and they could choose as many of those and other if they wish to. Um, what might stop you getting involved? And again, reasons that you've given that might stop you, we could use and then have an other that people could fill in. And then um, what might encourage you to get involved in the future? Um, and we could use things that kind of keep you coming back, but also things that might help other people get involved. And we could even include that, you know, having someone who's had experience in as getting involved as a person to speak to because we've got we know that through familiar faces so we could we could include those answers so we have what you'd have then is that section of the questionnaire be quite quite neat quite discreet we've got the yes the kind of advantages disadvantages and solutions essentially um and that would be your that section of the questionnaire does that make sense in terms of what that might look like? Can you all kind of picture that relatively, relatively easily? Um, and the way we would, and why we need to think about the wording is because you'd want it so that whether or not you've been involved is not necessarily the bit that's relevant because we're going to ask people if they've had past experience of it, past or present experience. But actually, we would be getting responses from healthcare professionals about what they think the reasons are that people get involved or that might not get involved. We'll be asking the public what they think the reasons are. So we'll be getting these answers from these different groups of people that we can bring together and say, are the public saying that the reason people get involved is for, bear with me, is for vouchers or for, I don't know, some kind of a claim that and that that's why people get involved and you might have healthcare professionals say people get involved because they're bored um i'm i'm being very drunk here i realize it's, it's deliberate it's deliberately being like this i'm not i'm not actually saying these reasons um and then you've got the lived experience saying well actually it's because we really want to try and find more answers it's, it's so you could have then a actually when you look at this one question across these different groups actually we're all talking a very different language and it helps us to say well if we're going to change people's minds if we're going to help people see things differently we need to know what they're already thinking in order to then look at how we change change opinion if so we we need to be able to say we've talked to all these people and actually this is the case um so that's kind of how it would work across those different groups is you'd have those three questions and you'd see what people thought the answers, what, what they gave their answers as. Um, and so technically you'd have, you could have multiple choice, but as I say, multiple answers, but then you'd also encourage people to include a, an, an additional other um, if they can think of other reasons. So that makes sense. We're quite happy with, with what that could look like. Okay. Continuing our theme of working backwards, uh, David. OK, if we've passed the first question, um, surely the second question must be around their own personal experience. Of PPI? No, no, of the illness. Ah, you see, you're, you're, you're going up two sections. You, you skipped a Well, section. not really, because you've asked them how they want, why they want to get involved. Um, and because they, they want to get involved because of an experience. So then you want to know what that experience is. Has it been oh, a, I've got you. You get what I'm getting at, yeah. Yes. Okay. So so whether yes, so whether people whether we have the option for people to expand. So that's that's where again, that's a questionnaire design query for you. So whether we say um reasons people get involved and they might have other 
or they might say they get involved because of their experience of knowing someone with dementia. Now, we could have the option that if you would like to expand on this reason, please fill in here. Um, or we have, so that, that would be a question of, do we, do within that section, do we get people to expand? Or actually, should in the, the early section, that first section, should we be including, do you have experience of living with or knowing someone with dementia? Could you tell us a bit more about that there? So it's, although we're doing it backwards from a, in terms of helping develop it, it doesn't mean that these questions will go first in the questionnaire because that would be confusing. These will probably still go last. Um, but yes, one of the things when you do questionnaire design is you have to think, where might we expand on? Um, which questions might we go into more detail on? And with all of that, that is what we're constantly trying to kind of battle, I suppose, is how much detail do we need to answer the question? How much detail is helpful? Because you never want people to give lots of information that we can't do anything with, because that's very frustrating for everyone, that they've shared a load of experience, and then you say, actually, I can only take that one line of it because the rest of it is going to have to go somewhere else. Um, and what we can say quite neatly from from this idea of if we ask if people give multiple choice answers is what we would do essentially to analyze those is you would give them all a assign them all a number essentially and then you'd have a list of people that said number one or number two or number one and two um and so you'd get that in a in a nice you all know how much I love a spreadsheet. You could get that in a nice little spreadsheet that was all these people said both, these people said just one. And you could look at then the patterns of responses. So how many people are saying which one? Is there a difference between who's saying it and why? Or actually in the answers where people could expand, has has have lots of people put the same thing? And then you could assign that a number and kind of go, right, well, actually this is coming up regularly. So we'll we'll make that a number and we'll look at that pattern. So it's quite a, a manageable thing to analyse um, because you'd be looking at are there similarities and differences in which ones people choose and why and are there things that we haven't thought about so that then if we were telling others about the findings of our questionnaire for that section only, ignore the other sections for now, for that section only, what we'd be able to say is, for example, well, we have found that one of the reasons that people with lived experience get involved in PPI is they to find answers because there's not enough. Um, they don't feel that there is enough answers given um, from standard routine healthcare, or um, actually the, the reason the majority of people are getting involved is because um, there is a significant lack of support services available and PPI acts as a support service. Um, we and we might be able to say they're the ones that have the most answers, which means we'd be looking at the kind of quantity of responses in that sense. Um, you wouldn't, with the questionnaire, as often be looking in as much depth. That so depth really comes from when when you kind of go. Actually, lots of people here are saying that the reason that they are coming to PPI is that they're they it's their main form of support. And then what you could argue is that you'd want to do a follow-up interview with people about that lack of support or about those lack of answers and really try and understand what they've been offered um, and what those differences are in terms of, you know, in different areas. Is it based on um, different diagnosis types? There's, there's lots lots you could go into. But in a questionnaire, it's it's harder to really tap into the detail of that but you might get a general picture and that picture can be used to help us um, move forward, help us suge suggest further research or, or further need to talk to people in more detail. Um, I've just, can you all hear okay with, despite the fact there is vacuuming going on? Okay, cool. Um, so that's, that's one of the kind of ways to think about it. Now, because of the time, I'm not going to start on the next section. Instead, I'm going to, I'm going to give you homework um, because I, I know it's a lot of information that um, I'm throwing at you here. And what I would like to do is two things. The first thing is that I will create 
a kind of mock up of this section of what this section on a questionnaire could look like. Um, and what I would ask from from you guys is to provide suggestions to those answers. So which what multiple choice um, options we could include. So for you, it would actually be just filling in the other because at the moment there wouldn't be multiple choices to pick from. You'd be you'd be creating them yourselves. Um, so that then for the next meeting, we can have all the ones that you've suggested as the multiple choice options um, for those different sections. So you could see what those three sections will look like. Um, so what I would probably do for that is create a very short, um, I'm assuming online is best for you, but a very short um, online survey that has um, just, just, just the questions and then an open answer box where you can put as many of the possible reasons you think in. Um, and then I can take those and put them into a multiple choice version of the same form. Um, does that sound doable? And is everyone happy for that to just be an online form where we send you a link and you just type in your answers? Does that sound okay? Lovely. Okay. Um, so we'll do that so that for the next session, you can see what that section could look like. Um, and you'll be able to see if you actually end up giving very similar answers or different answers so we can do it among the group what those differences are um and we can then decide how many options do we think is um is enough multiple choice wise because you might go oh among us we've thought of 20 reasons and we might not want 20 multiple choice options so we might together go let's narrow that down to the our top five or our top three or, you know, so that even if we end up with a lot, that doesn't mean that's what the final picture looks like. This is all about building um, the questionnaire as we go. Um, so that would be good for that section. The next part, and this is where, as I say, it's to give you a bit of time to think about it. Um, but this is where the questionnaires that Helen sent you really come in, because the questionnaires that Helen sent you are questionnaires that look at knowledge of dementia. Now we talked about, as I say, that being something that we think is really likely to shape. Sorry, Fiona. I've not been sent any questionnaires. I've emailed them to you this morning, Fiona, but I also did put them in, put it in the post to you last week, but I don't know if we've got your address right. Okay. <laughs> they are, <laughs> I did email them this morning yeah. as well. Um, just so I got, I got the overhead things there just now that you sent out for Rosie, but oh, anyway, that's fine. I'll have a look for them. We can check your address with you after this um, to make sure we can, and we can, we'll get them to you. Um, if we, because yeah, depending on which address we have, um, we can do that. Um, it's just because some people find it easier to have them to go through um, on paper. Um, but they are basically just copied and pasted examples of questionnaires that other studies have used to look at knowledge of dementia. Um, some of them were used in studies that focused on healthcare professionals. Some of them were studies focusing on carers. Some of them were focused on, there's, there's a bit of a mix, deliberately so. Um, I haven't done any formatting of the question or anything like that. I've just, I've just copied and pasted them as, as they are. Now they will, in the same way that we're doing, those questionnaires will also have sections. So they will have sections that ask about, you know, what is your gender? What is your education? They'll have sections about uh, risk factors. They might have, you know, they'll have their own sections that they've decided are important. And what would be helpful is to think from these, there's a few things. And again, I will put these as some bullet points for you as some, um, in an email um, because I think it'll be helpful to narrow this down is which questions just focusing on for the purpose of this knowledge of dementia so trying to kind of narrow down the not worrying too much about participation not worrying too much about um other other factors that might shape knowledge at this point what we would like to know about other people's knowledge of dementia so what we would like people to answer in relation to their knowledge of dementia so, for example, something that I can't remember if it's in the examples that are in there, but something that I think is often very helpful when you're looking at this within the context of a wider questionnaire is a what is your self-rated knowledge of dementia? So from on the scale of I know absolutely nothing about dementia to 
I've got a doctorate in dementia and I will, I've I've spent the last 20 years working in it. I am I know everything about dementia. Again, not me saying this, just to be clear, because it is being recorded. Um <laughs> on on that scale, where do people sit? So you could get their self-rated knowledge. And then what you could do is then ask some questions about dementia and you can compare how correct they were with their self-rated knowledge. Because sometimes it's really interesting to find out whether their confidence in how they rate their knowledge matches what they actually know about dementia in terms of um, some key facts about dementia and whether they get them correct or not. That's one way of looking at it. And that goes with the kind of idea of including some yes, no, um, maybe questions about dementia. You might say, actually, I don't mind. I'm not worried about what they think their knowledge of dementia is. I just want to know which questions out of these five they get correct, if any. So you might you might kind of look at the examples and go, actually, for me, I might I most want to know, do people think that dementia is a normal part of aging? Right. That's what's most important to me. I think we should include that. Or do people think that um, people without a memory impairment can have dementia? Yes, yeah, so, you know, so David. I was just thinking, Rosie, one of the questions that you should be asking is um, if the, you know how many types of dementia there are, because many people think everything is all Alzheimer's. Absolutely. So you could have a question that says, yeah. how many types of dementia do you think there are? Um, or you could have a multiple choice where you say between one and three types, between five and ten types I realized that I didn't line those numbers up um but you could you could do <laughs> I was looking at myself going well, that was that was a terrible research example Rosie um so you could you could give them multiple choice you could not you could completely see um you could go either way as I say all of this is up to again whether you want to use an example that's already in there of a question whether you would like to use the whole questionnaire and include it within um, what we're saying, or whether actually you like, you might go, I really like what they've done here, but I don't, I'm not worried about these questions. I'd like to pick from these ones. Um, so there are different examples laid out in a different way with different numbers of response options. And for the next session, I think that's the next bit we should focus on. So if we do it across these three, uh, kind of across three meetings, I suppose, where this one we've got our uh, right, we kind of know what we want to ask about experience of PPI. So we've got that kind of covered for now. Go team. Excellently done. Fabulous. And you have a bit of homework for that. Next, your free homework slash what we're going to focus on in the next meeting is really deciding what do we care about in terms of people's knowledge of dementia and how it might relate to whether they get involved in things. So those those two things that we think might be important. Um, I will send these as an email as well. You won't just be left to remember this. Um, that's what we can focus on in the next one. And then once we've got an idea of, again, just be a draft of what we think those key questions are. Our final session in terms of the early draft, not but in terms of drafting it, then test with others would be what do we want to know about the person so we've got the what we want to know about their experience of ppi what we want to know about their knowledge of dementia and then what do we want to know about who they are and so that's where i'm saying when you look at some of these questionnaires try not to get too distracted by the fact that they will also be asking who they are i mean if you want if you want to just go to town feel free to start that section too but i think that's where it gets confusing because there's so much so I would, for now, kind of skip the bit about who they are, put that to one side, because we can get we can go into that in more detail collectively. Um, so the stuff around age, um, stuff around where their education, gender, all of that, we can talk about what what we want to include, and that's fine. But for now, just focus on their questions that ask about knowledge of dementia, and which ones you like, which you don't like, and have a think about why. If there's one that really gets under your skin. And you go, oh, I hate that question. Why? What's 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 causing that reaction? Because that reaction is really important to know because we don't want somebody else to, we don't want to put that question in and make somebody else have that same reaction. Um, so it's a chance to be quite reflexive on, on which questions you're leaning toward, which questions you think, why are they asking that? Um, and feel free to write all over it, make notes all over it. You can say, why on earth is this in here? 
perfectly valid. Um, so all of these questions have been used in research. That doesn't mean they're right. It doesn't mean that they're the best one. It just means they've been used. Um, so it's a helpful starting point for us because we know that other people have answered these questions, um, which means we know we can get the answers to these questions from others. But it's also OK if you don't like it. And there will also be terms within there, having a quick scooch through, that you go, that is a horrible term. I, don't, I wouldn't want to use that term. Um, or I don't understand what that word means. Again, all very useful because we will not then use that same term or that because this is your questionnaire. This is not theirs. This is not healthcare. This is your questionnaire of what you want to focus on. Does that make sense? I know it's a lot of information and I know we were going to go through those questionnaires in more detail today, but I think actually because there's so much we could do, I think it makes sense to just strip it back a bit more and say, let's just let's just chunk it. Let's just take our time. Um, getting comfortable with what this could look like in different sections. Does that all sound okay? I know it's been way more of me talking than was meant to be the case. Um, but does it, where, where is it sitting with you is my question. How are you feeling about it now? <laughs> I'll say good. <laughs> and thank you, Helen. Got them now. <laughs> Fabulous. Yeah. Yeah, so no, no, it all makes perfect sense to me. Yep, quite logical. Yep, happy. Excellent. Fabulous. Winnie. Oh, you're on mute there, Winnie. It has to happen once. You're on mute just now. It's exactly the way that I had imagined it to go. You know, that, that the idea of them wanting to know why people want to be part of, of PPI and, and working from there. To me, yeah. that seems more sensible than just giving them a questionnaire. Yeah, so working, work, stepping our way backwards so that we know how we got to where we got to. Yeah, and, and do you know, it, it, I hadn't thought about it until we were, as soon as we then started going, oh, hold on. Actually, yeah, we need to work backwards from what we're trying to answer. So I'm glad that that, that makes sense. And we can pretend that that was always the plan. No one yeah, needs to know that, that <laughs> it was that was always always what we intended. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, this is why I don't make notes and plans because then people can hold me accountable for when I do it the wrong way around. <laughs> uh, but no, I'm really pleased that's making more sense um, and that we can go from there. I will also send um, slash Helen if she doesn't mind. We'll send with the so we'll make the little mini survey um, with the link. But we'll also send a copy of the, these slides so that you can see them because that just so you can go through them in your own time if you'd like to, because they have they have obviously those kind of food for thought questions that you might want to think about when you're looking at questionnaires. Um, as with any work we do as PPI people. Um, spend as much or as little time on this as feels right for you. You are under no obligation to spend a long time working on this at all. Like this is, as much as it's, you know, we're saying this is gonna be your questionnaire and it's for you, but if it doesn't fit with your time right now, that's okay. You know, this will, we will work around what works for the group. Um, we know that you will have lots of different commitments at lots of different times and that's all right. So please don't feel that just because we're working on an activity together that it, there's a strict, we must have this done at this time, but it is not that's not what this is this is about a group of us being able to kind of explore research in a new way um and understand the full process and and i do think the questions that we've even started asking today are helpful for you know when a researcher comes to us and says i'm going to do a questionnaire with um with care homes and i want to ask them this isn't this what do, what do your group think straight away you're going to have a better sense of well hold on how did you come up with those questions? Were they questions that you came up with yourself? Were they questions that somebody else came up? You know, it, it helps you start to think, oh, what might I want to ask about that before before we give it the green light? Um, actually, has it who developed it? You know, can they there's it makes you think this is an example of what other researchers are doing. Um, it's just that you guys are doing it, um, which is very exciting. Um as a side note before uh, the end of the meeting, I know we're technically we've only got a minute. Um, I know I think all of you are involved in some way in the Partners in Research uh, 
paper or have been possibly um it will be new to you uh Mahashi it's something we kind of wrote up of what we did so far um where it had the summary of partners and research and what we did going on and I think um I think three of you are listed as co-authors um we have had feedback with edits which is a good thing because it means that they're willing to potentially accept it with these edits in place um essentially what happens next is I will need to write responses to all of their comments and which bits we're going to change and which bits we're not so I will do an initial draft of that and then it will get sent round to you so you will be getting an email from us about that as well um, for you to have a look over and see whether you're happy um, we may find that there are some suggestions that we don't want to do and that's okay too because sometimes they make terrible comment suggestions where you go nope there was a reason for that um, but um, that will be coming soon. I will sort it and let you know um, as soon as I can. But for now, that's our plan. That's what we're doing for the co-research meeting. You can get some homework, have some pre-work for the next meeting. And next meeting, we're really going to focus on that knowledge of dementia. Um, and Maheshi, I really hope you can join that one as well, because I know obviously you have experience of of really asking those questions. Um, so it'd be really good to know um, which one do you found helpful in terms of if you used any of these scales before or whether you created your own and that would be really great to get your feedback on as well if that's okay um but yeah thank you very much if you have any questions just give me a shout um but thank you for your patience and helping me work out the best way for us to do this it's, it's